Look, I've got some additional um, economic impacts there. Uh, I think the one I wanted to focus on particularly was the, the value-adding nature of the, of the project. It basically, in, in unit, uh, you know, apples with apples, doubles the value of, uh, of this product uh, from Tasmania. Australia currently has a $2 billion um, trade deficit in forest products. So we're importing $2 billion more product into, uh, into this country um, than we're exporting. Now, this project has the potential to turn that around by about $450 million a year. So to, to reduce that balance of trade deficit by about 25% with one project. And so hence the, the value adding focus um, uh, and uh, you know, the clear benefit as far as that's concerned. Look, I think we've spoken about most of these aspects. Uh, uh, we had stringent guidelines to start with. Um, we've gone out and, and our whole intent has been to, to, to source the best mill that we possibly can. And we believe that we've done that. In actual fact, um, the, uh, the consultants we've had working for us from Finland, Puri, who have been involved with every uh, pulp mill development in the past uh, uh, 50 years, um, simply don't believe that you can buy a better mill uh, in terms of technology. We're putting up the best that we possibly can. And the question is, is that good enough or isn't it, basically, at the end of the day? I talked about the odour abatement system and improvements in water recycling, generation of up to 100 uh, megawatts of, of surplus power that I spoke about. There's also another um, interesting aspect to the project, and that's in relation to, to greenhouse gases. Um, uh, the, uh, the project, whilst the plant itself uh, would have an, an emission of, uh, of, uh, of carbon uh, equivalent of about um, uh, of about 146,000 CO2 equivalent tonnes per annum. When you take into account the scope two aspects of, uh, of, of, of the greenhouse balance and look at the offsetting of the green power that's generated through this process and the offsetting of green power um, through that biomass, uh, which is uh, green power, qualifies for, uh, for renewable energy credits. The offsetting of that versus, uh, versus um, the, uh, the less friendly power generation aspects mean that the project as a whole has a huge um, uh, positive in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And built into that as well is, is what happens at the moment with ships taking all of that raw material of, uh, of, uh, of, of fibre overseas when in actual fact only 25% of that vessel is, is usable product. And so there's a huge benefit there as far as, uh, as far as greenhouse gas is concerned as well. So the project has a large positive as far as that's concerned. So look, at the end of the day, um, uh, we've used the most sophisticated technology to deliver the best environmental outcome. A rigorous evaluation process to ensure that the project doesn't impact adversely and inform the community about social, economic and environmental outcomes. We believe that the, the, the benefits from the project are, are very significant. And at the end of the day, um, we believe that we have a responsibility, and all of us have a responsibility, to ensure that, uh, that we are contributing to the environment in the most uh, positive way that we can as far as the manufacturing and downstream processing of product is concerned. And I mentioned earlier that at the moment we we, we willingly buy this product back. We have no understanding where it comes from, uh, what the environmental credentials are of the mill that's produced that product overseas somewhere. Um, you had a look at the step change and the quantum shift that's been made and the mill that we're putting up is the, the best that you can have. Um, this is, if you're buying this from overseas, you're, you're most probably getting it from, from older technology plants um, that aren't quite at that level yet. And so, are we comfortable to do that and to buy product in from overseas where we don't have an understanding of the, uh, of the environmental credentials associated with it? Or do we want to manage that on our own turf um, under stringent, stringent regulations and make a positive contribution as far as that's concerned? And the opportunity certainly exists with this project to do just that, and that's, uh, that's what our focus has, has been. Look, further information, uh, a range of, of, of websites. As I said, there's some material up the back if you'd like to, to know more. I just wanted to leave you with, with, uh, with something um, in terms of the, the distribution of pulp mills through Scandinavia. And I have superimposed uh, Tasmania um, onto, uh, uh, onto Finland here. Um, and uh, you can see that, that uh, in, a, in a Tasmanian sense, 
Uh, and these are all pulp mills here um, uh, throughout Scandinavia, that uh, we would have 10 pulp mills in an area uh, of Tasmania in Scandinavia. Now, um, uh, there was an interesting comment uh, earlier in the day by Ziggy about, um, uh, about communities actually lobbying to, um, to attract nuclear power plants to, uh, to their shores and, and, and to their particular towns. Um, that certainly occurs in the forest industry. Uh, it's very competitive with, uh, with, with these towns actually wanting these mills. They believe so much in them. And look, at the end of the day, I've spent a lot of time with, with people from Scandinavia over the development of this project, and you keep coming back to a simple question that um, do people in other places around the world have a less, less of view of environmentalism than what we do? Uh, are they prepared to harm the environment or despoil the environment in some way uh, or um, uh, potentially impinge on future generations and their own children um, in, in, into the future with this style of development? And I think I'd have to say a resounding no to that. Um, if anything, I've noticed Scandinavians to probably have more um, presence or practical presence for the environment than what we do, uh, but yet they have this kind of distribution of mills throughout, uh, throughout Scandinavia. And I think it's an interesting thing to, uh, to close on uh, today. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to come along. More than happy to catch up with you some of you. A very simple one. Uh, just the quantity of effluent, how, how many litres per hour or per day or whatever will be coming out? Yeah, look, it's, um, it's, it's 64,000 litres per day. Um, of, of effluent. So the intake of water into the project is, uh, is about 24 uh, gigalitres um, and the effluent is about the same uh, basically from, uh, from the project and that's on a per annum basis. 64,000 litres per day? Correct. Can I tell you, and then uh, Colton can uh, correct me if I'm wrong because I think this is a reasonably important point. 64,000 litres, 24 gigalitres of effluent getting pumped into Bass Strait. My understanding is the volume of dioxins, dioxins in that 24 gigalitres is equal to a single grain of rice. That's very good because, I mean, I'm, Correct. I'm out of the timber industry, so I mean, we've, we've, we've been supporting this all the way. But one of the most common questions you get from people on the streets, you know, because they, you're in the timber industry, they think you, you know, you know is, 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 is this effluent into the... You know, mm -hmm. And that's the sort of thing we need to tell them. If it's 64,000 litres in 24 hours, but the, the dioxin, I think you said, is equal to one grain of rice, that's a simple, that volume-wise, that is a very simple message that we can, give, we can put to the people on the street. Yeah. We have to break it down to that sort of... Well, and, that, and that's a per annum. That's the per annum. So for the life of the mill, the volume of the same material, of the dioxins, is the size of a small marble. 30 years. 30 years of pollutants into Bass Strait.